Good evening, welcome to everyone. Thanks for coming. Today we are celebrating the second conference of this 13th edition of the Awaken the Planet Needs You. As you know, we are talking about how to adapt to all of this that is happening each time more and more. And, and we are going to see more of this in the next years. As I was saying yesterday, the adaptation to the extreme climate has many facets. In this edition of Awaken, we have been talking about four. The economy, we had a debate, very interesting, with very original ideas that were very interesting. And today, we are going to have two persons of first line, each one in its own field. I had the fortune to be more or less one hour and a half talking with Jean Francois and, and deepening in his thought. And, and I cannot say anything because it will be a spoiler. So it's better that you enjoy him. Then we have this uh, documentary that it is very nice and we will see it in the big screen. Tomorrow we will have the representatives of the different, different social areas that can affect our life and they can take decisions and know how to take decisions so that the citizens, we adapt to this new reality. We will have a representative of United Nations, we will have the State Secretary of Environment of the Spanish government and the Vice Councillor of the Community of Madrid and also a person that will talk to us and knows a lot about how to manage water that is a factor, main factor in this issue. And the last day we will talk about how do we feel ourselves, our eco anxiety, how to overcome all of that and to face all those bad news with a positive attitude and try to see all these situations with a, as an opportunity. Then the first thing for me is to thank this Casa Encendida because of allowing us to, to have this conference here and the, and the guest we will have and hope you will enjoy. I am Angel Cano from the Association Awaken. I hope you will know me. Uh, we have been 13 years here. And I invite you for a couple of things. First, that you visit asociaciondespierta.org and you can subscribe there and we will only send you interesting things. And second thing is that if you want to follow us or send us Twitter, our hashtag is Ciclo Despierta. So enjoy the movie and we see you later. I would love especially after this tremendous dose of um, energy. It is, it is said that this energy empowers us. I would love that you think about what can I do? As the Dalai Lama says, that this is the time to understand that the things have changed and we can't stay just as if nothing is happening. We can spend time, a part of the, our time, to do something for the environment, for others. This is the, the aim of AWAKEN, is to encourage people to understand that the situation has changed and it requires, to, it requires the contribution of each one of us. Today we are going to talk about collective intelligence, how to cooperate among ourselves and where the world is headed. We have persons that know a lot about these things. And normally I, mo I moderate the debate, but in this occasion I think, I thought that two geniuses should uh, should uh, have this conversation. So I would love you if you can, if you can clap to Cristina Monge. I will introduce Cristina and she will introduce Jean-Francois. 
it will be a conversation among themselves. She is teacher of sociology in the University of Zaragoza. Cristina is working in the Foundation of Development. If you follow the environmental world, you will see that she is she is working in many things, ecological development. She's in she's on the TV, and very soon we won't be able to have you with us. Many thanks, Cristina, and many thanks, Jean Francois. We are going to listen to you. Thanks, Angel. It's an exaggeration. He knows that if he tells me to come, I will come. But I have to say that the one who admires it's me, because Angel Angel is the responsible of this edition of Awaken. I was looking behind and I was thinking how many years we started with this. I think it was in the house of the cows in the in the Retiro. It's been 13 years since we started. I had my child at that time. Congratulations, all my admiration. And it is an attainment to to be here because I think these these events have been a space for debate of uh, reflection on these questions and many things to Jean-François Nouvel because he is in Madrid this evening. I want to do a couple of things. I want to introduce him officially and then I am going to explain you what I saw and I was surprised. I will speak in Spanish, he will speak in English. And there's simultaneous, simultaneous translation. If anyone needs the... Thanks to the translator before... <laughs> we will try to speak slower, but if we are taking speed, you give us a signal. Who is? Jean-Francois Nouvel. I'm sure you must have read things. Officially, he is um, a researcher in collective intelligence, so that the, he studies how the system, living systems evolve. He works in cryptology in technologies to for the post-monetary society. He advises leaders and uh, he lives an experimental life and he defines himself as a human being with an open code. This is what it says in the website of uh, Jean-Francois. But I like it. I like it. Another paragraph that says he is the father of Esteban. How is Esteban? Esteban has 20 years and lives in is 20 years old and lives in Barcelona. And then he continues. I live in Provenza, the south of France. But I see myself as a, as an earth person with an open code. I see myself a little bit like a tortoise, tortoise tortoise. So, welcome Francois and explain us what is this? What is this? Living like a tortoise, tortoise. So, I will speak in English because I don't have a no problem. Español no está tan bueno, pero lo entiendo un poquito. Para el próximo año. El próximo año en español. Sí. Then you are in Spanish. <laughs> So this life that I try to live, yes, I try to live an experimental life. Mm -hmm. Experimental means that um, everything that we saw 
in this movie speaks about the potentiality. Like we see a potential world. And now we can ask ourselves, and I ask myself, what kind of human being can I become if I want to live in this next world? If mm -hmm. I want to leave the world that as we know it today, and what would it look like for me if I live in this next world? And so I tried to apply that to myself. And that goes not only in the lifestyle, the way I live, some choices I made, but also what is the change inside me? Mm -hmm. That means the very intimate fabric of myself. Because we have this um, tendency to see the world from an external thing, like what will we do with transportation, what will we do with our companies, what we will do with the governments and all these things. But we cannot forget this part of what I call the transpersonal development, mm -hmm. which means the society lives inside me, like I speak different languages. That means it's a, it has worldviews. I live in a given economy and that I, I, it activates some belief systems in me. I eat and breathe in a certain way. And all these things that will also change inside. So I try to also explore these things. And that has led me to lead that experimental life. Uh, for instance, to choose to live in the gift economy. Um, la economía del regalo. Eso te quería preguntar. ¿Qué es eso de la economía del regalo? What is that gift economy? Because in your webpage there is a reference. The economy of the gift. What is that? So we know it very well because we live in the gift economy with our family, with our friends, uh, with our neighbors, uh, with our colleagues. That means we just give what we can give and mm -hmm. we receive what we ask for, if available, of course. Okay? So we, we do it every day. Actually, the world, uh, nature lives in that kind of economy. Okay? But we can only do it in a small group, mm -hmm. at a village level. Okay, small community, our friends, uh, our colleagues, family. our teammates, family, and so on. Okay, but when it comes to civilization, when we uh, reach, you know, millions and tens of millions, we don't know how to live with this economy, and we invented the market economy. Mm -hmm. That means I give you something, and you have to give me something back, the counterpart. So we kind of solve the balance, the immediate balance. In the gift economy, you may give me something, you don't expect something back, but you know that. In my turn, I will give something else to someone else, maybe something very different. And it will go into a circular economy, but again, in a small group. So question, how can we scale up the gift economy? Because it has so many advantages, like uh, the, we don't need the condition of reciprocity. Okay? I can give or receive without a debt. I can give or receive because we have common interests. We converge rather than negotiate. Mm -hmm. right? So it completely shifts the whole thing. And so I asked myself this question, can we scale it up? Do we have the technologies today that it requires to deal with this level of social complexity at a large scale? It started with this question. But then I decided, okay, before I go theoretical at a large level, how does it work for myself? Mm -hmm. So I decided to um, give up you know, my bank account, uh, to give up the house I had, to give up my stuff, to offer my stuff, and to live every day on the gift economy. That means to give to the world what I can give, like conferences, my research, you know, R&D and all these things. And the wealth, the material wealth that I would receive would come from gratitude, gratitude. from kindness, mm -hmm. in, in, form, in the form of money or food or shelter or services, goods, Something. whatever. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I've lived this way for the past 11 years. Déjame profundizar un poco porque eh, si yo fuera un economista... Let me ask a little bit deeper. I am not an economist. If I would be an economist, neoliberal, I would say that's impossible because, because some will take advantage of others. This is the, this is the reasoning that will, that will uh, appear. I can say different things. First, whatever what we sell and buy, let's say an apple, okay, mm -hmm. an apple that you see on the market that you buy. Did you have to buy it to the tree? Mm -hmm. No, the tree gave it to you, right? I mean, everything originally comes from a gift. 
So the market economy can live because of the gift economy. And also, even if you become uh, you know, a rich person in the financial sense, uh, and you make a lot of money, maybe you don't want to forget that maybe you had a mom and dad, or people who served you uh, gracefully, you know, who offered everything they could to become the person you became. So let's, we tend to think that the gift economy lives thanks to the market economy, that the market can finance the gift economy. Actually, we should see the market economy as a tiny, tiny, tiny epiphenomenon <laughs> in the midst of the huge gift economy. Mm -hmm. Now we reach another kind of reality. So if I speak with an economist, I can say, oh, okay, you've, you've achieved great science in this tiny little thing called human market economy, and you have a lot of knowledge here. I recognize that. Mm -hmm. But do you realize that it has much more to it? Whole, right. Yeah. Can you in integrate that in a greater worldview? And I doubt that many economists do that today. I was remembering a discussion very broad about the basic rent that has nothing to do with this basic income and many people think that is a revolution maybe the, the opposite to the gift economy is the economy of suspicion when you talk about basic income there is a suspicion if you give money to people just because of existing you are promoting that they are not going to produce they are not going to they are not going to fulfill their, their task of their responsibility. But this idea exists of the basic income. And uh, it came to me connected with what you say of gift economy. So we put the suspicion in front. You are not going to you're not going to behave properly with the community. I find it interesting that we have um, common words to say, like to earn a living, or ganar tu vida. Ganarse la vida. Gonna, see, it has an incredible level of violence yeah. because it makes us believe My that, life is life. It's uh, mine. Yeah, that we have to prove yes. to others our right to live, mm -hmm. to ourselves and to our right to live. And this leads also to what we can call utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. That means to prove your worthiness. And I, so hence one of the things that I changed in my experimental life, I decided to become useless. <laughs> so it kind of contradicts in a certain way what we, what we reached, uh, what we, we saw in the movie, but actually no, it works together. Because I had to deactivate all these things that from the market economy where you have to prove something productive, yeah. the productive or extraction economy. Because we have that so rooted mm -hmm. in ourselves, you know, in the systems. We, we exist as a hologram of society. So by becoming useless, then I could relax and say, oh, I have every right to live because I live. Yes. <laughs> Just that. And by the way, you know, I think we have cats and dogs and pets mm -hmm. because they don't give a shit about <laughs> their usefulness. You know, you see a cat like this or a dog yeah. like this, all right? And we just see their happiness and we tap into this, this happiness. We connect with this kind of, of happiness. Mm -hmm. And what if we become like this, like just this happy human beings, which then liberates us to become creative in what we love doing the most. And then we will, that will take you, exactly what the movie says, that will take you to the right placement, the right people that you need to meet, mm -hmm. the, you know, the right environment because you offer the best of yourself. But I think you got to go to the space of deactivating all this uh, thing from the market economy with the utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Sí, en esa línea, efectivamente. El mercado como esa parte... Yeah, the market as a, this uh, principle of suspicion fundamental principle. I didn't want to talk about this, but it has come out. Because we wanted to talk about collective intelligence. And the documentary was dealing with this. 
with a perspective of proposing something. I am the one who feels that it's not time to complain. Okay, if you need to complain once a week, if it is useful, it's fine. But now is the time to search, to find ways to come out of this scenario. And I think we have the privilege to reflect, to read, and, and we need to have this moral obligation to find ways. And I think that Jean-Francois, he is finding ways. One of his proposals has to be with the, the collective intelligence. What's that? So you can see, you can understand uh, collective intelligence as life itself. Mm -hmm. Life does not exist alone. You don't exist alone, I don't exist alone. A virus does not exist alone. A bacteria does not exist alone. <laughs> so your very body, my very body, exists because of a collaboration of trillions of cells and bacteria together that came to collaborate uh, together through ages, through evolution. So, intelligentia collectiva, collective intelligence, uh, we can see it as a property of the living by itself. No life exists without this. Just look around you, you know, everywhere, whether you sit in a city or in this room, or you go in the woods, you will see collaboration everywhere, including in your own body. And that has become a science, a research discipline. We try to understand why, when you have two bacteria or two human beings or 20 million human beings or uh, rhinos or <laughs> zebras or whatever, or trees, what happens? Sometimes you have something called a body, mm -hmm. a we something, you know? So an ant colony, a flock of birds, a school of fish, a startup, a nation, you know? Those entities that tend to have some emerging properties of a we, of a body. When does this happen? And then, if you go further and you uh, explore uh, this question, you see that collaborations has evolved through the mm -hmm. age. Evolution does not happen like how you know we had dinosaurs and then we have mammals and, uh, and humanity today. <laughs> Evolution also, we can see it through the way beings <laughs> collaborated from bacteria to entire human societies today. So we can see an evolution through the ages. In our very species, we can see also this evolution. We began as small tribes, small groups, that we call, collect that we call original collective intelligence. The small group with a gift economy. Okay? <laughs> but then we reached some kind of crisis at the time. We became uh, you know, more numerous, more people, building uh, agriculture, bigger cities, more specialized jobs. And then, you know, the oral tradition would not work anymore. You would need something to evolve, okay? How do you evolve that? Well, because of uh, technology called the writing. And then we shifted to pyramidal collective intelligence, civilizations, mm -hmm. as we know it today. We still live in the pyramidal structures. That means a few people in power, and then chains of command, labor division, money, market, and all those things. And today, we also reached a limit with the pyramidal structures. They've created so much complexity, mm -hmm. just like the original collective intelligence in its time, right? It created complexity, and it could not deal with the world in this state. It had to evolve to make a quantum leap, and it created pyramidal. Same thing with pyramidal collective intelligence today. It's created such a complex world that now either it stagnates or even collapses. It could collapse or something bigger, more intelligent, more conscious will emerge. And we can see the rise of this called holomidal collective intelligence. Holomidal collective intelligence. And so what I do with, as a researcher, I try to analyze and document this evolution. How does original collective intelligence work? We have a lot of you know, sociological work on this. How do pyramidal collective intelligence work? Huh. Okay, maybe less work. We need to investigate a little more. What kind of limitations does it have? Because if we understand the limitations, then we can see where it wants to evolve. Because evolution always wants to yeah. address limitations. Always. Mm -hmm. When a living system evolves, it means it has to address some limitations. So where does it go? What can we already see today? You know, what can we observe today in this rise 
of this distributed you know, hollow middle collective intelligence. So I do this, uh, this work and try to document that. And again, not just as a, as a scholar, as a, you know, a researcher in the classical sense, which I do, publishing papers you know, and doing the fundamental research, but also by having that experimental life. Hmm. Like, okay, I see this next world. How can I live in, in this world today? I was remembering that this morning in a different meeting I was there and I heard a comment that something that when I when I went to the to the mines of Atapuerca in the north of Spain I don't know uh, how many thousand of years ago? In Burgos, exactly. And there's a team there of archaeologists, people that are researching and finding there in that place all the findings, showing them to the children. Maybe you have heard this. The first time I went to visit that place for the archaeologists, and they were explaining all the discoveries, and they found the, the bones um, of a girl that had some intellectual dis discapacity, of uh, 16 years old, and they were explaining how they found, uh, through a series of, of research, they, they put the, the focus on taking care, especially the most vulnerable persons at that time, and that group eh, was in our DNA in the inhabitants of that place. So what they found was the... So not sure I, I fully get the last question. Can you help me understand? If we see that in the prehistoric um, communities there were people that they have this collective intelligence so that they were able to, to help a person with um, discapacity. What has happened that we have lost that during our way and we have to claim now a society of taking care because we have lost that? What has happened in that path? I, I find it very interesting to see yeah, what we lose and what we win also. So if we see the original tribe, uh, as, as you mentioned this, uh, yes, you have this mutual care, and you have also the full integration of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So you have a gift economy, and you have the, uh, every worldviews from the root people, as we call them, they see it as part of the ecosystem. Okay. Now, when we shifted from this uh, oral traditions and this connection to the ecosystem, we shifted into much more abstract kind mm -hmm. of society. Like when you learn how to read and write, for instance, you you start to um, experience virtual worlds. Like you can read a book, and that takes you to a whole other reality. And also, our language evolved because we uh, we invented time, linear time, for mm -hmm. instance. That means we see time like if it existed on this table. And so that creates a whole cultural reality, kind of very detached from the physics of the world as our body could live it. And so that has created a disconnection, and we've lost that connection, if it addresses your, your question. But we've also gained other things. We've really moved from what we call the biosphere to the noosphere. That means when the culture becomes even more important uh, you know, become predominant. So most of our actions, most of what we will do will be cultural driven more than biological driven. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what does this evolution mean? 
we can see it as spheres, that we still have a body, we still live in an ecosystem, and we've built cultures, that means very abstract representations. How can we use them in the best possible sense? That I'd like to ask this, I mean, I have this question um, every time. How mm -hmm. can we evolve in this, uh, in this? And I find it interesting to see that um, a new form of evolution happens. We call it the theosphere. The theosphere mm -hmm. means the spiritually driven evolution. Not that people, you know, 10,000 years ago did not have this uh, spirituality, but they didn't have maybe this universality that we can, or this sense of the whole planet as a whole that we may have today. Mm -hmm. So now with, you know, 7.5 billion people interconnected, what can we build from that and what have we lost? Well, that remains an open question. Mm -hmm. What's the name? Theosphera? Theosphere. Theosphere. Like theos, like theosphere. theosphere. Okay. Yeah. So it, may, it doesn't mean in the religious way. I mean, we can see evolution. If we take a broader um, time span, more than you know, the past 20 years or even the past 10,000 years, we can see that the universe began with a, phys <coughs> with a physiosphere. That means the physics. The atoms, the particles, the mountains. It created you know, the material world as we know it. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then it started to combine itself and to create more complexity. And that creates living beings, you know, mm -hmm. cells and bacteria and all these things. And it started to create populations and bodies, you know, and animals and trees and plants and all these things. So it created the biosphere. Okay? And the biosphere became more complex. More complex. Okay? Yes. It started to create societies and some societies having culture, like abstract. Yes. Some mammals, you know, um, monkeys, elephants, dolphins, and of course humans have created cultures. They mm -hmm. have abstract representations. They have a language. And so we enter into the noosphere. That means the sphere of abstract representation and consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we live as human beings, we live, of course, in all these layers. We have matter, I have atoms, you know, and the physics still operate. And I have a bio 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 biological right. body as well. And then I have a culture. And if I don't live in those three spheres, then I lose something. Mm -hmm. okay? And if I continue to expand, then I can realize exactly what the movie, the documentary said before. I can realize that something more to me operates through me, like life and consciousness flows through me. And then I start to enter into even a broader sphere, the theosphere. That mm -hmm. means the sphere of the consciousness. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I believe that if we want to grow as human being, um, we want to involve ourselves in all these spheres. Every time we leave a sphere, a consciousness of the sphere, every time I become blind to one of those spheres, then I will become blind at the general level. Mm -hmm. So trying to do this work, uh, I find it uh, very fascinating, even to go to the depth of the matter, to bring that consciousness to the depth of the matter, and to also connect to the bigger sphere. So when we see the evolution at a larger scale, then we can see that uh, many animals, living beings, mostly live on, in the biological sphere. They need to address their biological needs. They may not have much of the noosphere, the cultural. But later in evolution, we see, wow, amazing sentient beings, okay? Mostly mammals, some birds, and, uh, and so they have a culture, they have a language, they have a sense of self yeah. also. And maybe some of them already have a sense of the uh, theosphere. But mm -hmm. we as human beings have a strong sense of that. But our societies that are more complex every time, they have taken, out, taken us to the opposite path. We have been able to abolish time and space. For instance, now someone from New Zealand can be watching us. Or this recording, you can see it in three years. If this is true, that this period has abolished time and space, how can we reconnect in a collective way? I'm not sure I, I understand. Maybe I will need... Um, <laughs> yes, you can speak so... Igual hablo muy rápido. I have some resonance in the room and that Perdón. will really help. Yes, if we, if we can have one of these, that will help. Gracias. Yes. Okay. 
Ah, que no llevaba traducción. Perdón. Perdón, perdón, perdón. So, the, the translation. So you can hear me, right? Okay. So, uh, she's saying that in a certain way, our societies are more and more complex. Nowadays, the degree of complexity has increased a lot. And so, there are some who say that the postmodernity has abolished the concepts of time and space because of these uh, technologies. The question is, if we have disconnected even from space and time from in this way, is it possible to find this theosphere that you were uh, sharing? <laughs> well, you see, when uh, any person who meditates actually gives up on time and space, <laughs> <laughs> you realize that uh, those things come as constructions, mm -hmm. and mostly cultural constructions based on our also our perception. Um, and so, you know, for instance, time. Uh, we say time accelerates, for instance. Mm -hmm. But you can also take another perspective on time. You see, culturally, we see time um, either as a, as a plan, like you have your, your planning, okay? And yeah. you can put as much as you can in 24 hours. And so you see the scarcity of time, yeah. okay? And this, the scarcity, <laughs> in the scarcity of time, you say to spend time, for yeah. instance. And you, ex use it, you use it in a scarce way, exactly like money. We have exactly the same language for time and for money. Mm -hmm. And now you can start to see the cultural construct yes. of time. To spend time. How much time left do I have in my life? How much time left do we have mm -hmm. in this talk? Mm -hmm. It works exactly like a bank account. How much money left do I have? Mm -hmm. Now, if I start to meditate or to connect in a more mindful way to myself, then those whatever minutes that we have together, those minutes left in yeah. our time account, yeah. okay? We can consider that they have depth. They may have infinite depth. That means this surface time that we have, we can address the level of depth that we want. Mm -hmm. We can remain totally superficial and say, you know, stupid things and, uh, <laughs> right, and chit-chat, okay? Or we can uh, decide if we want to have a deep soul connection. And maybe those 10 minutes or 20 minutes, or one minute, will change the course of our life. Mm -hmm. So, I, you see, I want to point here that we have a very biased cultural belief system, and that goes into very fa the very fa fabric of our language. Mm -hmm. The way we talk about time, or like the way we talk about love, or the way we talk about food and all these things, they have worldviews built in. And I believe, I mean, the work that I try to do, I try to address those things. For instance, rather than saying, oh, let's spend time together, why if I say, let's create time mm -hmm. together? Because maybe we create time. By the very action of existing, I create time. Oh, now I use a different language. That means now I start to create a different reality in me and between us. If we just say, rather than spending time, let's create time together. Mm -hmm. So how can we hack ourselves? How can we hack language so that whatever we address, like, you know, oh, time accelerates and we lose a sense of space and time, the question you, you just ask, in many cases, we will find very simple solutions to these things, not in the big technology, but in just the way we name things. Yeah. And I find it so important <coughs> to address this uh, the core of the language. Hence why in my experimental life, I've made deep changes in my language and things that people don't even notice. However, uh, very big, very big changes. It has completely shifted my consciousness and my way to understand reality. And I can give examples if you, if you feel interested. They say that the power is uh, the person that has power is the one who defines the words. The power is in the dictionary. 
Sometimes, in a, with our expressions, to waste our time or to spend our time, that is very clear. Sometimes it's a bit more subtle. We don't realize it so clearly. But yes, language is conforming our, our thinking, our, our way of our perspective. And we have decided to split the day in 24 hours, every hour, in 60 minutes, then we are we are losing our time. So this is like a construction. And one could think that this is very interesting, but it is going to be very difficult. Why do we need to do this? What do, what do you pretend with this perspective of life, so revo revolutionary? Because these are very basic concepts of our society, like uh, time and space. I normally teach my students, I teach in the education school, in the university, I give classes of sociology, and sometimes I, I ask them a question and they start to look at the ceiling, and I said to them, I say to them, why it is so important that the ones who are going to be your students come to the come to the school every day at eight o'clock because we need to be punctual and why do we need to be punctual with with five years in primary schools with 12 years in secondary high school is this the most important thing to teach that teach them that they have to be punctual why for what purpose and then when we you start this debate at the end, they reach the conclusion that we need to teach them that when they go to work, they need to, to be punctual. So then they realize. So the school is a fabric of workers. In sociology of education, we call this the, the occult curriculum. I think you speak a lot about these things. You share how there are many in many words and expressions, there is an occult curriculum. So, what uh, would what would this uh, give us in order to sol in find a solution to the challenges that we have? Easy questions. <laughs> okay. Yo sabía que era fácil para ti. I knew that it was easy for you. A few things. What you described, mm -hmm. like uh, becoming punctual or the schools. You talk about the schools of pyramidal collective intelligence in which we live. Yeah. And pyramidal collective intelligence has done a great job for uh, raising people, becoming or making them good in the doing, mm -hmm. and has done, a, has done a terrible job in the being. Mm -hmm. in the subjective self. And it has a very simple reason. Pyramidal collective intelligence works with chains of command, right? Top-down, vertical structures, command and control, mm -hmm. uh, labor division, and all those things. Okay. If you want the chains of command to work, you need predictable people, mm -hmm. right? You need someone to say, oh, I will show up Monday at 8. It doesn't matter how I feel. I mean, I disconnected the, you know, <laughs> my feelings. And I have a private life and I have a professional life, right? So we get raised into those, those things. So uh, the school, basically what the schools of pyramidal collective intelligence civilizations do, they normalize you. Mm -hmm. They make you predictable. Yeah. Okay? We, could all, we could also call it domestication. They domesticate you. And I don't say it in a bad way. I just say it works this way. But what we can see, what we can observe in sociology, and you know it because you do sociology, we also see worldwide an evolution towards individuation. That means more and more people asking themselves the, who am I? Mm -hmm. Exactly, you know, and it said, well, uh, people ask themselves, am I uh, my job? Am I my age? Am I my name? Am I my nationality? They ask those questions to themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they realize, huh, well, if I want to know myself, I got to get rid of all these things. I can see them as attributes, but they don't define me. I have them as attributes. And then 
the journey towards personal growth and individuation has begun. So you, Esteban, father. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I have two good news here, I would mm -hmm. say. We can see um, an emigration, mm -hmm. not just the ge geographical, but sociological, like more and more people kind of living the pyramidal structures because they see a gap between their being, which they reconquer, and their doing. Mm -hmm. And happiness always happens when you have a perfect alignment between your being and your doing. You do what your being tells you to do, and your being becomes what you do. Okay, So you can see it as two mirrors. So we see this kind of... Uh, emigration happening almost everywhere at different degrees. Maybe not the same in China or the same in Northern America or South America or Africa and so on, but we see it. Another good news, like how do we do this? How we, can we facilitate that? And th this goes into what I call the hacking, the self-hacking. Hacking. Sometimes I give conferences called Go Hack Yourself. <laughs> okay, you can see the English. Okay, not go yourself, but go yes. hack yourself, right? <laughs> okay. It goes in... Sometimes changing very simple things inside ourselves, but that can have tremendous leverage in the results, in the inner change and the outer change. And I can give you two examples that I applied to myself. I don't, I don't say you should do it. I say I did it myself and I could see the benefits. Mm -hmm. One, for instance, with the social codes. I've learned how to, to breathe before speaking. Do it. One deep, long breath. <laughs> what do you think a one deep, long breath can do when we speak? I don't know. Oh, you certainly have an idea. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it helps you deactivate the automated pilot. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I speak right after uh, a question or uh, normal yes. interactions, then I operate with, uh, you know, my habits, my automated pilot, right? Mm hmm if I breathe, I can connect to my emotions, to my being, to my feelings. I can connect to you. Yes. It gives, I can meditate. I can let go of my belief systems. I can let come inspiration. I mean, lots of things can happen if I breathe before speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine a room where people meet for a board meeting, for a school meeting, uh, or in a family around dinner. And imagine if everyone does that. Well, it may, it may look weird according to our, you know, standards. But you have, let's say you have 12 people in the room. That means you have 12 parallel brains <laughs> having their experience yes. in that moment of silence. And then what they will deliver will have such a higher level of quality. And having facilitated this uh, breath before speaking so many times around the world, depend, regardless of culture, I've seen this miracle happen every time you don't have the same decisions in the end. You don't have the same people in the end. You don't even have the same worldviews in the end. And we just changed, we just hacked one single tiny little code, like breathe before speaking. Mm -hmm. Don't stop interrupting one another and so on. And just practicing, practicing that for myself, I realized, wow, that has some consequences that I did not anticipate in the first place. Not only my consciousness, but also it taught, it taught me to, I, I could see that I can only speak with permission now because I can't interrupt. If I start breathing, you know, mm -hmm. and in many cases, you know, someone asks me a question, I, I start breathing, and then three other people have started <laughs> and after before. You. Okay, well, maybe so they don't need me. Maybe I can continue to process, process and meditate and enjoy the, and see maybe more, you know, patterns happening. And very likely, that moment when I will speak, when I will really speak, I will have had so much time mm -hmm. with myself that I may say something maybe on a greater depth. Not because I, I have more intelligence than others, but just because I gave myself some time. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I take that example like, okay, we want a greater consciousness, we want greater connectedness. Maybe technology can help, like high tech, but also maybe low tech can work. First example. Should I give you a second example? Yes. So, I said I decided to change something in my language. Yes. And I let you guess. I made a, a huge change. I don't speak you, uh, to, to you in English, actually. Mm -hmm. I, 
I use a different kind of English that we call E prime. Yes. English prime. E for English and prime as a derivative of English. Mm -hmm. E prime. Mm -hmm. I have changed something huge. Have you noticed? Uh, sorry? I have changed something huge, important in my, in my way of speaking. Have you noticed anything? Um, theocracy, theocracy, for instance? Just in my way to speak. Why? <laughs> okay. Why? I will tell you. Mm -hmm. I don't use the verb to be yes. anymore. Ah, no? Nope. ¿Os habéis dado cuenta? <laughs> no. You didn't notice, right? Okay. I just use it when I quote it, like I, when I said, you know, people asking themselves, who am I? Or those kinds of things. Am I my job? Am I my age? Okay, I quote it. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But if I speak for myself, unless yes. I say a quote yes. or I make a mistake, it can mm -hmm. still happen, but I've suppressed the, the verb to be. Mm -hmm. So I have hacked myself. Hacked. Okay, that means I apply like a simple rule, yeah. but that simple rule, that simple evolution in my language has created huge benefits mm -hmm. for myself. Mm -hmm. And I can explain why, it, of course. And mm -hmm. I will do that very shortly because we, we may have many other topics to address. En español sería complicado. In Spanish, it would be difficult. Es una distinción muy interesante también en español. Y hay otros idiomas donde no tienen ser. Ni en francés, ni en inglés. They don't have the verb to be, like no. Arabic, for instance, no, no, no. they don't have the verb to be. So, just talking about like French. Mm -hmm, I don't French. Use, I don't use to be in French. Yes. And I also don't use to be in English, in those mm -hmm. two languages that I speak fluently. So why would I do that? <laughs> why, I, why would I put myself in such trouble? And what, so what kind of benefits would I have? Yeah. So let's, let's take an example. Mm -hmm. If I say, um, Alberto is shy. Mm -hmm. Let's say I say that. Mm -hmm. You have no choice. Alberto is shy. Okay. okay? I, it has the isness, yes. okay, of it. It has nothing to do with your subjectivity or my subjectivity. I think that Alberto is shy, or the you know um, the French people are this, or the women are that, or the uh, the the teachers are this, whatever, or are not. Every time I say are, are not, where, where not, and all those things, I push a reality onto yes. you, and you yes. have no choice. Yes. Now think, imagine if I say, oh, I met Alberto yesterday and I found him shy. Mm -hmm. Or I think that, or I believe that, mm -hmm. I have the experience that. Mm -hmm. That's just everything. Because first I don't push this reality onto you. I don't create this social violence onto mm -hmm. you. And also I benefit this for myself because now I acknowledge myself as a uh, my own responsibility for why, what I experience. Mm -hmm. If I say I think that, it means I say to myself that I produce what I think, or I feel that, or and so on. See? Yeah. So in my own narrative to myself, then I become responsible for my own real reality. I step out of the illusion that this reality exists independently of me. So not only I stop the social violence and pushing things that are mm -hmm. onto you, okay, but also I evolve by becoming um, more conscious. I create more mindfulness because in my own language, in my own narrative, then yeah. I yeah. become responsible for myself. Ahora te pongo yo dos ejemplos. ¿vale? Ahora soy yo la que now, pone dos ejemplos. I am going to put a couple of examples. First, the inclusive language, the language that is not non-sexist. The feminist movement is talking through, has been talking through decades about this, to make everyone understand that we need to recognize half of humanity. And there has been a reaction of those who think that it shouldn't be like this. The other day, in a meeting, someone talked about people with vulnerability and another friend said, more than vulnerable people, we have to talk of people in situation of vulnerability. At this time, they have a situation of vulnerability, but they don't need to be always vulnerable. 
So this is conforming our way of thinking, the way of understanding the world and how do we react. So time is passing by. So maybe there are questions. I don't know if we have a microphone for the public so that they can ask questions. So the one who wants to ask can raise their hand. Is there anyone who wants to ask something? Comments, questions, whatever it is. If you tell us your name. My name is Francisco. Thanks. I would have 10,000 questions, but I, I was trying to, to note them down. You mentioned that dimension, the cultural dimension versus, I wrote it like this, versus the biological dimension. My question is, must have been a mistake? Maybe it, maybe that is what has, has taken us far away from the natural instead of being alive like the other beings in nature. This is first quest, first question. And the next one is connected regarding this, wherever where we have reached. What is your opinion of the metaverse? Metaverse. Metaverso. You have the floor. Yes, very, very interesting questions. Thank you for, for asking them. Uh, so, yeah, culture has taken us away from nature, and we have this debate, you know, culture and, uh, and nature. But I wouldn't blame culture uh, itself. I would uh, mostly question, again, the this evolutionary phase of pyramidal collective intelligence. I don't want to blame also pyramidal collective intelligence, exactly what they said also in the end of the, of the documentary. It has done its job, okay? Mm -hmm. Like creating civilization, creating a sense of self, individuation, um, interconnectedness, so many things, good things and bad things. So I have no judgment about it, but I see it as an evolutionary phase. But now, yes, if we want to reach the next step, we need to still include what we've uh, gained from that transition and also to transcend that. As Ken Wilber would say, transcend and include, okay? So today, you, me, every one of us here, we have nothing against uh, that would stop us from reconnecting to nature. We can mm -hmm. do it any time. And by the way, one of the things that I decided to also to do, I, I decided to adopt a vegan lifestyle. That means to um, respect all the sentient beings that I see around that we exploit, we slaughter, we make them suffer, we enslave, and so on. And I see it as a possibility that we all have to connect to the web of life, to recognize them as brothers and sisters, and we want to build a society with them and build new policies and all those things. So, again, I would not blame culture itself, but we can see how the pyramidal Collective intelligence has made us good in the doing, but not so good in the being. Has created the kind of culture that separates us. But culture itself can also generate amazing things for reconnection, for integration, for inclusion mm -hmm. of the biosphere, of the biological nature of us. And now, I, again, I, I share my more like a, a belief that I have based on my research, but I want to claim it as a, as a belief, as a stand that I have, okay? And I don't claim it as a universal. About the metaverse, um, it seems that uh, evolution will take us more and more again in those different spheres. Remember the physiosphere, the, bio, the biosphere, and we have not finished with the uh, noosphere, the one of the cultures and symbols. Today, we already have two beings. I have a being in the biological, no doubt about it, okay, when we both have this. 
And at the same time, I have a being, also an online being, a digital being, a digital self that exists. Today, it exists through you know, um, social networks like Facebook, uh, like Twitter, like, I mean, all the social networks as, as we know them. Does this <coughs> digital self belong to you today? No. It belongs to Mark Zuckerberg, it belongs <laughs> to Google, it belongs to you know, those, those companies. So it still operates kind of some part in the new world because yes, we have distributed networks operating for sure, but at the same time, operating in the old economy with the ownership of things. So what do I think about the metaverse? I think we'll get more and more immersed in different realities. And the, real, the question that I have uh, comes always in the, same way, in the same way. Whose hands holds the hammer? That means who owns the technology? <laughs> if we have distributed open source technology, maybe we can accomplish amazing things in virtual or parallel worlds. Okay, maybe we can deal with level of societal complexity, uh, create uh, very advanced consensus with millions of people. You know, emerging um, emerging decision making, uh, fantastic ways to represent very complex and abstract realities. Maybe we can do those things in a distributed and open source way. But if I have to do those things and pay a license to Google or Amazon or some new guy or new venture in the future and become enslaved by those things. I don't want this kind of world. Of world. So hence, uh, I, don't, I don't blame the metaverse in itself or let's say the abstract or virtual worlds by themselves. I always want to ask that same question, same for artificial intelligence, same uh, for transhumanism, who owns the thing and what do we do with those things? That seems more important questions than this kind of evolution itself. I don't know if uh, I addressed some of your questions. There is a kind of mirage in the and all what it has to do with this digital world. We have been many years saying that the cyberspace was a public space, but in reality is very private, is radically private. So sometimes we say social media is a new space of public communication. No, they are very private. They are bubbles. There is someone there. Good night, good evening. Many thanks for this initiative and this invitation to reflect. I don't know exactly how to formulate. I am the mother of a child of 10 years, Paul. And whatever we are sharing now to activate ourselves at the level of consciousness, of reaching a stage in which we can do something effective. This makes me question, at the end, the true reality that we are living, the parents in our society, is the dictatorship that we are, we are with the tablets and all these gadgets that are affecting in a way that is inhuman. They are destroying the families. The communication is finishing as we had before. My concern is why, how can we, how can we make a call just as we are saying how important it is to, to be, become aware, as a mother, I am horrified that I don't know sometimes how to manage this problem of the, of the tablet. I have, I have said today, let's go to a place where there are no tablets, where we can communicate this is going to be the investment of my life because 
I don't know the future we are living. This is going beyond. It is something like it's a it's a kind of an invisible war. We don't have tools to to battle with this. What is your advice? Because your opinion for me it's a luxury to have someone that I can like you that I can ask you from your wisdom with all the pros and cons of the technology. We say that there is no line of space and time. Thanks to the technological evolution, a child from New Delhi now can be a YouTuber and, and earn money. There's, that's a miracle. But what do we do with the children that have, are now absorbed since two years? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so I had exactly the same question. I mean, my, my, I have a 20 years old son and he faced the same thing because he grew up at the age of internet and the tablets and the smartphones and all those things. And he dropped out of school. He didn't uh, feel good at school, uh, although he went into an alternative school, I know. But even there, um, he felt uh, kind of trapped into some kind of old system. And I could say that everything or most of what he knows today um, he, he learned it from the internet. Uh, and, and I talk about very physical things, you know, like he, he loves to do, um, he has a very healthy lifestyle, uh, he does lots of sports, he, he has expertise in nutrition, uh, he had adop he's adopted also a vegan lifestyle, he knows everything about uh, ecology and all these things. And so he's really transformed this use of kind of consuming, you know, um, just, you know, all these games and all these uh, stupid things into something for him for himself, and he's made this choice. And of course, I hope we as parents, we and his own environment helped him. So again, it goes into the same question: Who owns the technology? And of course, if we go in those spaces owned in, by the market economy itself, then it has every incentive to keep you hooked online and to give you drugs, drugs for the brain. Okay, yes. so. I don't want to say that this, that you don't should not use a little bit of this, of course, but you want to become mindful of this usage. So again, that technology, you know, like watching videos or or doing games, who owns the technology and for what purpose? Do they use you as in the extraction economy? That means they extract something for you in return to some drugs, or can you also? Uh, participate in creating very powerful, nice, collaborative, uh, playful technologies, because we also have them. So I think our responsibility as parents in this generation, even if we don't know how to code, if we don't know the kind of the core technology, I think we can gain maturity in understanding how this technology work and what do they exactly serve in order to to incentivize them in the right way for our children. And we have plenty of new things that can, uh, that can happen. Plenty of great YouTube videos, plenty of uh, uh, fantastic collaborative tools, plenty of fantastic games that will also make you grow and develop your, your skills. So this choice, uh, the also the knowledge of the design really matters for us as parents to, to understand how these things work. And then also to keep the balance between, yes, the biological, the physical, the sensing, the physical space, and the online space, how we try to balance those things. I tried to give that to my son. I feel very happy today how things went, although we always have some, uh, some new things to, to explore there. Um, just one last thing for the maturity, uh, for the understanding. We will see in the next few years those crypto technologies. Mm -hmm. Crypto technologies doesn't mean crypto money, okay, or cryptocurrencies. Crypto technology means those those technologies that will 
work in a distributed way. That means you don't have a centralized server controlled by a few with the old economy based on that. Like you need as many people on this, you control the rules of the game, you gain, suck in the data from people, you know, this kind of uh, system that we have today. With distributed technology, that means we can play together, we can um, organize the city together, politics, economics, in a bottom-up and distributed way. That means no one owns the power on the others. And so I believe that we, as parents and as citizens as well, we should become literate in understanding the importance of this distributed technology or distributed applications. And you will hear more and more about those things in the future. And so as a parent, you may help your children or your child to use more and more this kind of technology and also to educate them to understand the importance of those things. I feel so amazed to see so many kids that at an early age have become so aware of the ecology, consciously aware you know, of, the, of the ecology and the stakes of this world. And so after a certain age, they can really shift to using those, those kind of technology. I see this miracle happening with more and more young people. So I don't know if it, I mean I don't think I can answer the wholeness the wholeness of your question of course <laughs> because it has so many parameters but as a, as parents I think we have maybe the duty to become aware of those next technologies those distributed technologies that will come up in the next few years and that will empower us as citizens but also as parents Cuántos padres y cuántas madres se hacen a diario esa pregunta How many parents ask themselves this question, but not, not everyone has uh, the fortune of being here to listen this answer. My name is Cristina. I have a question, okay, for Jean-François. Jean it's about the morphogenic camps. Okay, because uh, you haven't mentioned about uh, Shell Drake, for instance. Drake, yeah, and I would like to know if uh, with uh, your research, uh, you think in the future we are going to be more interconnected also, but without words, mm -hmm. in, in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, great question. I think, well, first, you know, this experience of interconnectedness, we have it, we had it forever. When uh, you look at uh, Aboriginal people, for instance, in Australia, they have a very strong sense and uh, a culture of this interconnectedness. And when you connect with root people all across the world, those who still practice, you know, this relationship, this interwoven relationship with nature, they all have this, uh, this sense of that. So I think that, I mean, not just I think, we observe that when we reconnect to our biological nature as well, then we get this sense of interconnectedness. Now, from a scientific perspective, and what the, this researcher who men you mentioned, Rupert Sheldrake, has uh, talked about morphogenetic fields. And because we see, um, we observe the non-locality of ideas and innovations happening at the same time through the world. For instance, you know, the fire, for instance, <laughs> you know, happen in different places and in no ways uh, some technologies or discoveries could have gone through communication. They happen simultaneously. Um, as a researcher today, I also notice and do myself this experience of non-locality. You see, the materialistic world and the positivist uh, thinking from the 19th century has told us that the brain produced consciousness. But the facts don't support that. When you look at the facts of collectives and how collectives work, if, if the consciousness just came from the brain, the collectives as we see them would not work. Something else creates this coherence. And it seems more that the brain or the bi uh, biological structure captures consciousness, just like an antenna. Now, if you have the body of an ant, you will capture an ant consciousness. If you have the body of a dog, you will capture a dog consciousness. Mm -hmm. And as a human being, if you continue to do personal development, then you will expand your spectrum of consciousness. 
And sometimes you can, with meditation, some can, some substance and rituals, you can go into a specific range of consciousness, okay, or a specific spectrum, not the everyday consciousness, but something that will, you will discover either with a substance or some meditation rituals, you know, practice and so on, okay? So to me, the evidence, and I think we'll have more and more evidence, research evidence that will show that consciousness exists as a flow, as a non-local thing, and when we densify as a being, as a living being, when we embody, then we capture a certain spectrum of that consciousness and we turn it into material action. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, that said, in my own, to speak just about my own experience, the fact that um, I live in the gift economy and the fact that I suppress the, word, the verb to be in my mm -hmm. language, and the fact that I breathe before speaking. Mm -hmm. Just let's take those three examples that I shared today, and I could go with other examples. It has deeply altered my consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I can say, like living in the gift economy, I had to surrender to that amazing experience that if I live joyfully and aligned and in my creative self, then the right events happen at the right time. No more, no less. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone I've spoken with on this planet, regardless of the culture, the level of education, everyone who surrenders to his or her joy and becomes, you know, does what the being, the true being, tells them to do, they experience what Carl Jung called synchronicity. That means the non separatedness of events in the universe. And today, I can say that I live more in a reality of synchronicities than just causalities. The materialistic world tells you the world goes with causes and effects, just a big domino effect, you know, particles colliding with another particle that creates these things. The, the Cartesian or the uh, conventional <coughs> phys physics thinks that. Quantum physics proves it, proves it otherwise. We don't live in a causal world. We live in something else that we cannot really define, but in a subjective experience, I can tell that, huh, the more aligned and joyful and the more inner power I allow to myself, the more I see miracles, literally, like events happening and none as the cause of the other. They just happen simultaneously, okay? Huh, interesting. <laughs> Hence my question as a researcher, can we build infrastructures that will help you go in this direction as a human being, that will help our kids to go in this direction as human beings as well. Can we build technologies also can, that could help this? Institutions, policies, technologies, high-tech, low-tech, it doesn't matter. I really sit with this question and I believe that evolution could take this uh, direction and more specifically with those crypto technologies, <coughs> these distributed <coughs> technologies where maybe, you know, consensus or the right things may emerge, not just because of causal effects, but this simultaneity of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And maybe we build those uh, technologies of synchronicity. I see myself, the web, not just as a big database kind of thing, but I've learned to use it in a way so that it creates synchronicities for myself. And saying that, I feel aware that I use a language that can only talk about causal things, like... I create synchronicity, huh? I talk causal here. So also when our species will evolve so that we have also a language that can express synchronicities and not just explain the world or reality in a causal way. Big question. <laughs> Fenomenal. Tenemos una pregunta por allí. Sí. Ah, perdón. Por aquí. Perdón. Vale, pues allí y luego aquí. A ver, ¿hay más cuestiones? Digo, porque tenemos que empezar a ir pensando en cerrar. ¿Hay más temas? ¿No? ¿Hay más no. cuestiones? No. Bueno, ya, sí, pero, pero el tiempo todavía estamos en esa concepción. Still we are in the concept of time, in which at 9.30 we have to, <laughs> we have to leave. Abu llévete, xerera jaezui, xereta para uaupe, jaxeñe guaraní. Abu llévete, muchísimas gracias a Ángel, Adriana, a toda la gente. Many thanks to all of you for celebrating these 13 years of this program. 
My, my mother tongue is Guarani. I learned Spanish here. I learned the difference between to speak and living. I live in Guarani. Guarani is the, my, my mother tongue. I want to sh give you three words that maybe are useful. The first word is in Guarani. We have many words to say we. We have more words to say we than words to say I. Ore is like the we, small. Yande is the we, bigger, like the whole country or all the world. And we always talk about we. And here in this context, I, it was difficult for me to speak always about I, I. I wanted to share this. The second word is il pora. In Guarani means humanity, mankind, but not the quantity of people. It means water and earth and spirit. We are spirits made of water and earth. Then scientists said we are 70% water. But our grandmothers, they, they knew that. How can we give pain or, or to the earth or to the, to the water that we are part of? And the third word, you, you said the economy of the gift. My grandmother taught me when I was young, count with your hand. If you go to find an avocado, you have to count with your hand. One for the earth, so that there are more avocados. Second, for the sky, for all the other birds and animals. The third is for the community for our fellow companions in the community. And fourth is for, the, for our food in our house, that community, that small community. And the fifth is for the one who is to come. The fifth has to, be, has to stay in the tree like the legacy or the next generation. This is our perspective and our practice of this gift economy, these five parts that, that um, you have in your hand. And this word means the place where being, where to be. So this is the place where we are as we are. This is really a gift. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this. And you see today in the uh, civilizational world, we would call it policies, for mm -hmm. instance. See, and yes, you've uh, you've ex you've given a perfect example of a different social code, at, and how language could name a different reality, and so has the importance of evolving our language. And of course, we cannot invent like a brand new language for the next reality. We have to start from what we have, and so um, I invite each of us every day just to build this methodology, this attention to the words we use. And so you've given an example in your mother tongue of very important words and distinctions that um, conventional language that we speak here today don't have. So how can we invent new distinctions? How can we also, like you gave the, also some example, we would say, you know, the poor, the unemployed, and all. So just like if reduce 
we essentialize people to one attribute, a temporal attribute that they have. You know, maybe they got unemployed for a certain certain amount of time, but that doesn't make them the unemployed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, we have to really pay attention. For me, when I hear people thinking the next world, um, most of my inner time, my inner attention goes into the language they use to describe this reality. So I, I really invite each of us to question every day, to become vigilant about the language we use, and one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I won't use this word anymore. Or maybe uh, rather than saying spending time, I'll say creating time. You know, those kinds of things. Rather than falling in love, rising in love. You see, just <laughs> sim simple details like this. Rather than saying, I am French or I am American. Oh, I have a French passport or I have the French nationality. So that I, I kind of cut this internalization of those attributes. We can really build this uh, awareness in our everyday life in a very practical way. And that means, you see, no high tech here. Just this uh, vigilance that can have tremendous leverage in our lives, I, I think. So thank you for your testimony. <laughs> Por aquí. No? Pues entonces tenemos que cerrar. Lo dejamos aquí. We are going to leave it here. Many thanks, Jean-Francois. Many thanks to all of you for being here. That has been a gift for all of us. Many thanks, Angel, to involve ourselves in this. We have been 13 years. I think it's a miracle. I don't know how many more we will need to wake up to all these aspects that Jean-Francois has made us aware of. Many thanks and good evening.